<laughs> no, no, no. no I, ha I have, I have to, I have to do a short introduction. I, I promise it will be really short. <laughs> as soon as I receive the the okay that we are live, mm -hmm. I'm seeing something on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we're live. Oh, yes, we are definitely live now. So. <laughs> Um, saying a big hello to everybody who is listening to us today, either here on Zoom or on Facebook Live. I am Elena Koman from Associatia TechSoup, and as always, I was I will basically loosely facilitate uh, the conversation that is happening here. As some of you remember, we have started this week with a series of capacity building events and webinars created by the Romanian American Foundation in partnership with the US Embassy in Bucharest and with us, Associatia TechSoup. And today we will be talking about how to structure and deliver webinars for teachers. We are extremely lucky to have with us today an amazing expert who will take us through this entire process of designing webinars for teachers. Um, and I will very shortly introduce you to Alan, Alan November, our guest today, who is an international leader in education technology. Uh, his professional experience includes position as the director of uh, an alternative high school, computer coordinator, technology consultant, and university lecturer, and other things I will let him tell, tell you himself about himself. Alan, thank you so much for taking the time to facilitate this topic for us. Um, I think I will officially give you the floor and I will just step into the background and I'm here, both me and my colleague Roxana, for any te technical support you might need. And I will also stop the sharing. Alan, do you hear us? Fix that. Okay. Yes. There we go. All fixed. Thank well, you. This is an amazing honor. Um, and what this is one of the more exotic presentations I, audiences I will ever have. So I am I am thrilled, and I certainly hope. Um, you know, disclaimer up front. Obviously, this is some of this is just personal style. You, everybody, I think, has to present in a way that is comfortable with who you are and how you feel about your topic and um, your technical knowledge. So take what's useful, discount the rest. Uh, just to let you know, I'm a little ant random abstract thinker. So I tend to, I tend to bounce around. Um, if you're more linear, this might drive you crazy. So I'll, I'll do my best though to accommodate a uh, range of learners. So first thing I wanna do is suggest that a personal uh, story to start here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug in my, um, I'm gonna share my screen um, and go to the desktop. And hopefully you're now seeing uh, two photographs. The one on the left is a Japanese toilet. It's a control panel. Maybe some of you have been to Japan and, and you've used this. Uh, it's, it's quite the amazing uh, piece of technology. Uh, these three buttons actually do crazy things. Uh, it's a self-cleaning toilet, which if you don't know this is coming, is, is quite the moving experience. Uh, it also gives you a lot of data. This. Uh, LCD display gives you a lot of data about your body. There's a computer chip in the bowl and it's a medical device, sends email to your doctor's office. And it also uh, can communicate with other devices. For example, well, Toto makes this. This is made by Samsung, this refrigerator. Uh, I happen to have this refrigerator in my house here. I'm gonna plug in a different camera and see if I can show you my refrigerator there that's the refrigerator uh, this is the big screen you see on the powerpoint i'm hoping you see this now 
um, what do you see? Do you see the PowerPoint or do you see my image? Oh, we we still see the the PowerPoint. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing and then. Oh, yeah. You yeah, should yeah. see my my image. Yeah. So the way this works is, uh, you know, everything is is on the internet. You know, this is the Internet of Things. So your toilets on the internet, your refrigerators on the internet. This is actually a metaphor later for, for teaching and learning. Even though this looks like it has nothing to do with teaching and learning, I think it's an amazing metaphor. Uh, the toilet could be able to communicate with your refrigerator. And uh, here, I'll, I'll try to zoom in on my refrigerator. You can see this big screen here that's on my refrigerator. This uh, now has reflection, and if I touch it, maybe it will come on. Uh, now you can see all kinds of things, family photos, images, there's all kinds of data on, on the screen. And one day, what's gonna happen is, it's gonna talk to your toilet and your toilet's gonna send information to your refrigerator. And the refrigerator is gonna talk to you because a thumbprint on the handle will let the refrigerator know it's you. And in my case, it might say, good morning, Alan. May we suggest more fiber today? So the refrigerator will know what the toilet knows. Toilet sends its data. Refrigerator is a smart refrigerator and gives me better service because it's all part of the connected house in this case. So my, my sense is there's a lot of change coming to learning and the idea that we're going to connect things that have never been connected before, like a toilet and refrigerator, to actually improve your life, I think is a super powerful idea. And what I want to do is re really two things now. I want to talk about the big ideas in education, the content that I happen to think is important across all subjects and grade levels and different ideas are presenting. So just to, just to stop here, this one idea is to start with a personal story, even, and then make a link to that, to your, to your content. I think teachers appreciate um, a slow start, maybe even if there's some humor in it, can go a long way. Um, so I often will start with things, also dissonance is powerful lining up things that typically are not lined up can be a very powerful way to present. In fact, very often people will talk to me about my toilet years later. I've been doing this for a while and um, it's what they remember. So off, off we go. I'm going to uh, see if I can get back now to sharing my screen. Um, go to my desktop. Uh, yes, we can see, and if you can also put it in presentation mode, if it's possible, so we can have a better look yeah, at it. Yeah, um, let me uh, play from current slide, see if that's oh, any better. It's, it's perfect, thank you. Is that okay? All right. Yes, yes, yes. All right. The other thing I think is important to show, when I do show PowerPoint, and again, this is a style thing. I almost never have any text on, on a PowerPoint slide. It's almost always an image. It might have an image and some text, uh, but I'm a visual learner. And again, this is what people tend to remember. This happens to be a classroom at Harvard, just to tell you the story. Um, it's got a lot of computers in it. Every student has one, it's all on the, all on the web. Uh, it's a physics classroom and uh, just to give you a sense, this is the professor's classroom today. If Harvard were in session, it's completely left the uh, teacher as transfer of knowledge to uh, an environment that is totally student driven. In fact, in a, in a three hour class, and I think this applies for almost any subject, um, you'll have to let me know if you have one that doesn't. Um, my sense is we have underestimated kids' ability 
to be self-directed. It's one of the major problems I see in learning that, that our schools were set up uh, to learn how to be taught. That was the first slide you saw. A lot of technology, but those students are learning how to be taught. These students are learning how to learn, how to engage with one another, uh, how to experiment. Um, it's a very, very different classroom than the first one you saw. This one, by the way, gets much better results. Uh, it's incredibly better. So the opportunity we have today uh, is a fundamental shift from learning how to be taught to learning how to learn. And in fact, with that, I'm gonna go back to my desk. I mean, it's still in my kitchen. So I'm just gonna walk down the hall, unplug my, uh, my little video camera and, and keep going about 20 feet down the hall. So images, just to tell you, images to me are very important, especially of students, especially if you can get, for those of you who are working in schools, teaching colleagues, I would have kids come to the seminar if that's possible, even demonstrating right in front of other teachers how they learn. In fact, my sense is that's, that's one of the most powerful ways um, to for, for teachers to understand new developments is to actually watch kids learn. So I'm gonna show you videos and some other things we can do with webinars, but if you're in a school setting, I would have kids presenting. Um, let me uh, just go on. One of the big ideas um, is for students to design their own problems. And th this is uh, a cup uh, and, and the student is challenged to figure out how to design a problem around a cup. So in the old days, what we would do is we would say, if you're looking at the left of this, what's the volume of that cup? In the new days, we say, uh, design something around this cup. So on the right side, you can see what a student designed. Puts in a vertical, puts in a radius, uh, invents an ice cube, takes off the web and says, if three ice cubes are dumped into that cup, will it overflow with an inch left at the top? Now, that is a really complicated problem. Um, and I'm showing you an example of student work, which I think is really important that we show what real kids do during presentations. Um, so the one on the right is the work of the student. And Frankly, it's a phenomenally, if you're not a geometry teacher, it's a phenomenally creative problem this student came up with. And one of the big ideas moving forward across all grade levels from preschool through university is that students become problem designers uh, rather than be given only a set of problems that the teacher presents. You also learn a lot more when students invent their own problems about how they're thinking. In fact, let me uh, jump to a tool set. I think one of the most important things in presenting to teachers is to show them practical tools. So we can do a, we can do a quick sense. I'd be very curious if any of you have used Wolfram Alpha. Uh, one of the things I really like to do is show teachers tools that will make their life instantly easier. So here we have Wolfram Alpha. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's a knowledge engine. Uh, it's a computational thinking tool. It's the only one of its kind that I know about. I actually think this is one of the most important tools in all of K-12. For example, uh, if I type in uh, Macbeth, in, and you're welcome, by the way, to go to Wolfram Alpha. Uh, I would encourage you to, if you can open up another screen 
and, and do what I'm doing uh, wherever you are. So it's wolframalpha.com is the web address. It's free. And off we go. Hopefully you will be doing some of the things I'm doing. So we type in Macbeth, uh, just to give you a sense of what this engine does. Um, as I said, it's a computational thinking tool. So it reads the play in about a second. It takes a computer very little time to go through a lot of data like a play, and um, at least a Shakespearean play. And it immediately gives you data. A lot of this data won't do you any good, right? It's just data. Who cares that there's 17,000 words? Um, but one of the things that's interesting when you scroll through is you can get patterns that you can't get with a human being. Literally, it would be very, very difficult. So what you're looking at here are these blue dashes. And these blue dashes for Macbeth represent when he has a speaking role on stage. So you, you see the, the major characters and you can see that uh, Lady Macbeth doesn't have a speaking role in act four. These little vertical lines designate the, the acts. So Lady Macbeth doesn't show up in act four. Malcolm doesn't show up in act three, nor does Macduff. And Banco, he doesn't show up at all after act three. Uh, so one of the things that I've learned about teaching kids and presenting is to show patterns of information that people might not have ever seen before. Because when you look at uh, this kind of pattern of a visual representing the entire play in one screen, this is a powerful idea because you can start to ask questions about the whole play that you might not even ask if you read the play. For example, it would be hard to keep track of all the major characters. Look, Macde Mac uh, Malcolm has the first speaking part and he has the last speaking part. Why? 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 And Malcolm and Macduff tend to show up together. You know, why is that happening? And why doesn't Lady Macbeth? So you get to ask questions when you show patterns. Um, and I'm fascinated by teaching people to really take the time and a process of asking questions. Questions, I think, is the lifeblood of learning. Whoever asks the most interesting questions I think is going to be ahead of the people who are not asking interesting questions. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you a moment. If you could look at this pattern, hopefully everybody can see it, or maybe you're on Wolfram Alpha yourself and ask a couple of questions about, about the play. Even if you've never read it, it doesn't matter. Use your imagination to come up with some questions about this pattern. And I'll, I'll let you do that for about 30 seconds. Okay, now, uh, in one process of teaching people how to ask questions, there are two kinds of questions. There's an open question, who had the first and last speaking part? Mm -hmm. we, well, the answer is Malcolm, we know that. So an open question doesn't lead to debate. Uh, I mean, a closed question doesn't lead to debate. Closed question means that once you get the answer, you're finished. 
An open question is why doesn't Lady Macbeth show up in act four? That can be debated probably for a long time. Um, and and so, I also, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alan. I also have a question here, for example, I have an, a question asked, were Malcolm and Macduff friends? Yes, were they friends? Were they brothers? No, absolutely. And I, I wanna build on that question. It turns out that there's good research that shows if a teacher can show a prompt such as this pattern before students engage in the content, there will be higher motivation to then go read the play because students have asked their own questions and students will do better with the content. So it's actually quite an important process of getting kids to ask questions before you go off and engage in teaching. Uh, then what becomes really interesting is there's an, another process where you take all your open questions and you rewrite them to be closed. And you take all your closed questions and you rewrite them to be open. So if we take the, the uh, the open question, why doesn't Lady Macbeth show up in act four? We may want to say, well, what was the last thing she did in act three? We need, we need closed questions to prepare for the open questions. Or when does she, when she does come back, what's the first thing she says? So what's fascinating is when you deliver a prompt such as this prompt, and then you get students to engage in asking questions and you make them highly disciplined in changing open to closed and closed to open, you can actually teach kids to ask better and better and better questions. And from there, you have this amazing opportunity of organizing the questions as a teacher that the students generated and providing it to the class as a guide rather than a guide the teacher created. So it's a shift of control to the entire class to generate a teaching guide by their asking their own questions. Now the concept of that I think is just fascinating because what you can do is you want to teach people to learn how to learn. So getting people to ask their own questions, really, really important. Here, let me go back with Wolfram Alpha and, and give another example of a kind of a problem. So I'm going to get rid of Macbeth. And I'm going to type in, uh, let's see, uh, 6x. Let's just do a math problem. 6x squared plus 2 equals eight, then you're gonna type in the word solve. I'm just gonna, just gonna run this. Um, Wolfram Alpha will solve any math problem in the curriculum. Calculus, trigonometry, algebra, elementary math. It'll just do anything. And it will show you uh, answers. Uh, plus one, minus one, if you solve for X, shows you the parabola that you get. And over here, it will show you a step-by-step -step solution. So if I click on this, it shows me every step for solving that problem. Well, you, you, <laughs> you show this to math teachers, and I'm just gonna tell you, it's a very provocative idea. Uh, some teachers think this is just awful, that students will cheat and, uh, it's the end of kids learning and other teachers think, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. So when I present, I tend to want to play out the range of answers of teachers in the audience. I try to acknowledge different responses to the same tool in this case. 
I've learned that my own enthusiasm for presenting can get in the way. So I just have to acknowledge this good research on this to acknowledge um, the fear and anxiety of presenting something new and to say, that's okay. Just, maybe you just wanna use it for your own case. But other teachers might, then you might show examples of how to use it that people might not think of. So for example, I could ask you now, how do you straighten out this curve? So th this parabola represents the graphical display of this, this equation. So what do I do to the equation to make this a straight line? Now you really have to understand what's going on between this equation and this graph. So I'll, I'll give you a moment. If for those of you who are on Wolfram Alpha, just go back up to the search bar, you know, up here and do something to that equation that makes that a straight line. So all of a sudden in math class, you don't have to give step-by-step step anymore. That's over <coughs> for some teachers. What you can do is challenge kids to think about what do we do to change an equation to affect the design of the graph? So many of you have probably figured out if I take out the exponent and leave 6x plus 2 and run that, <coughs> excuse me, then I get a straight line. So this is actually fun, I think, that you now have a tool where you can really challenge your kids and watch them. In fact, uh, one of the big ideas of all this technology changing the role of a teacher is that teachers don't have to present as much. They can just say, go to Wolfram Alpha, write these equations, change these equations, play with them. And the teacher walks around the room and watches kids, which is a very different role than uh, presenting. So in fact, let me show you what you can do online uh, in this regard, um, if you're designing webinars. So um, I'm gonna show you uh, Flipgrid. Maybe, maybe some of you know this tool, Microsoft owns it. It's free now. When they bought it, they made it free. So if you, you knew about it earlier, now it's free. And Flipgrid um, allows a teacher to create a channel, almost like a YouTube channel, where kids log in and they use their phone to create content. So in this case, what you're seeing, what I'm scrolling through are kids in the same class. They could all be home during COVID. Um, and they chose a problem. Choice is a really big deal now that we don't assign, we, we let kids choose. So here, I'll give you, give you an example. So I'll, I'll just play I just one. Do problems Hopefully you can hear this. 7.2 slope fields um, where it's asking us to match up the equation of a derivative with the slope fields. So, so what all of these represent, what you're seeing here, it's just a cell phone camera uh, zoomed in on a piece of paper. And this calculus student is explaining how she solves this problem. Uh, please note that there are 37 views of, of this example. There aren't 37 kids in the class. What's, what's really fascinating about online learning uh, is that you've got a lot of kids want to know um, what other kids are learning. Here, I've gotten out of my my Flipgrid. Let me let me go back to it. I um, I want to make a couple more comments about about my Flipgrid. 
Um, this is actually a friend of mine who, who teaches calculus, uh, Stacy Roshan. There's Stacy. Um, she was teaching an online class, just to let you know, and she didn't want to teach the online class because she felt a sense of loss of uh, personal um, connection to kids because they weren't face to face. So she had to do things she's never done before online. And you can think about this in designing your webinars as well for teachers. Uh, and what she discovered, the reason I was showing you there were 37 uh, views of this girl's example is these kids all watch each other. It's not part of the assignment, but they do it anyway. It turns out that students really are curious about how other kids solve problems. They wanna know how they compare. And so what you can do online now is you can build these incredible communities. And I think building community is a really powerful idea when you're, when you're working online that you uh, have this sharing going on. So I don't know if any of you have ever used Flipgrid. I would love to hear if you did. Um, the Flipgrid website is flipgrid.com. It's free, get an account. Uh, you can build community this way. Really, really quite a lot of fun. Um, for those of you who are doing workshops for teachers and you know who's coming uh, in advance, you could use Flipgrid uh, to build community that way for people to say hello, show their classroom, just have fun with it. Um, and then everybody can scroll through and see what's going on in other people's classrooms or whatever your assignment happens to be. So let me kind of uh, check in with you so far. Uh, any observations or questions or commentary up to this point? And I guess we're good. We're good, okay. Okay, another uh, strategy. Let's see, you know what? I'm gonna go back to show you one more thing with Wolfram Alpha. Just for fun, um, Wolfram Alpha, underneath Wolfram Alpha, there's an example tab. Here's examples. Click on examples and you will see everything in mathematics, uh, science, technology, chemistry. You should see what it does to balancing chemical equations and solving for physics variables, uh, words, linguistics, money, finance. It does so many different things. It's amazing. Teachers, I think, really appreciate practical tools that could make their life easier. For example, uh, words and linguistics. If I go back to uh, the search bar in Wolfram Alpha, and I get stuck on a word, I'm writing poetry, and I type in a word like love in Wolfram Alpha, it will immediately give me um, every definition and uh, pronunciations, the history of the word over time, that was Shakespeare, uh, it gives you synonyms, antonyms, broader terms, rhyming words, close words. It's really pretty amazing what this does to a word. So this tool, Wolfram Alpha, can really help teachers in lots of different subjects um, generate content. And for teachers who want to take the risk, teach kids how to use it well uh, so that they're not just teaching each other, but a teacher, for example, in mathematics is teaching kids to change a variable, change an exponent, so that kids are engaged in uh, being creative. In fact, let, let me give you a really nice example. Um, this is an example of student work. Again, I like to show student work. This is a website of a teacher in California who whose students have been challenged over the years to design little two, three minute tutorials to help all the other kids learn. 
I want to give you an example of a tutorial that a student has designed. Sixth grade math. Hi, I'm Bob, and I'm going to show you how to do prime factorization. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a factor tree. A factor tree is you take a number, such as the number 32, and you break it up into its prime factors. So 32, we're going to break it up into the numbers 2 and 16. So we're going to try to get it down to all prime numbers. A prime number is one. OK, so you, you get the idea. I don't have to show you all three minutes of this. Um, but one of the most powerful ideas is to look at student work. Um, and this little girl, if you were to watch the whole video, I'm just scrolling through um, to speed this thing up to a couple seconds. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Bob, and goodbye. So she, she does the video twice. Does it in blue, does it in magenta. And uh, what's really fascinating about student work when you show student work is to explain things in detail. I like to explain things in detail. Um, I actually interviewed this girl to find out how much time she spent producing this tutorial. And she told me it was three hours. And I was stunned that it was three hours. It's only a three minute video. So I said, why, why three hours? She said, well, I had to show my friends and give them examples that would be different. So when she starts factoring 32, the first time she uses the prime number as one of the first two factors. The second time she doesn't use a prime number. And she said she had to do that because in testing when she only did one, she uh, discovered that all of her friends thought you had to start with a prime number as one of the first two factors. So that gave her a sense that her own example was limiting uh, her friends really understanding how to solve this math problem in different ways. So the stories I think are important to tell stories of what students are thinking when you, when you show student work rather than just say, here it is, um, I think are very powerful uh, and, and can lead teachers to much deeper understanding when you, when you get a chance to do that. Here, let me give you uh, a crazy idea now. I'm going to, uh, do you know how to use Google? Sometimes I will ask people silly questions, like, do you know how to use Google? And uh, uh, here, if I type in ear mouse BBC, maybe you could do this with me, ear mouse BBC. In fact, it would be great if you could all do this with me. Uh, and then if, depending on where you are in the world, you might not get what I'm getting, but I'm gonna guess that toward the top of your results is this BBC website. So I'm gonna click on it and just show you. This is a crazy photograph of a mouse with a human ear on its back. And uh, one of the, one of the more powerful ways I think to present online is to uh, take things uh, side by side. So um, if I open a new window and I do a quick search, um, I'm gonna go to Wikipedia because I know there's another example of this mouse on Wikipedia. So there's the mouse, different website. And you and I both know that, you know, if you want to, you can, you can show things um, and jump from one to the other or side by side. This website, if you read the opening paragraph and I'll try to engage people in doing things while I'm presenting. So if you don't mind, what's the action verb? of this sentence. It's one word, uh, it explains how the ear got on the mouse. Uh, action verbs are things that elementary teachers teach, how we interpret text. So we walk away with an understanding of how things happen. So the action verb is grew. Scientist who grew a human ear on the back of the mouse. So that's the action verb. 
on the uh, Wikipedia example, um, and I do think it's a fascinating idea to show different versions of the truth. The action verb here, if you had time to read it, is implanted. It's not grow. Those are two very different explanations of how that ear got on the, on the back of that mouse. In this case, the Wikipedia article says it's an ear-shaped mold. And what you can do is present different versions of the truth. And then you challenge people, which one is true? So I'm gonna give you a moment. Uh, do you know how to find primary sources with Google? So I'll, I'll challenge you. Uh, the only way to know the answer to this challenge is to find the primary source. Uh, one of the original scientific papers that explain uh, what happened in a lab that created this mouse. So I'll give you I'll give you two minutes. See if you can find the primary source. You really have to know how to use Google in order to do that. So you're testing your Google skills, right? Good luck. We'll, uh, we'll put these things side by side. All right, by the way, when I present, I do tend to ask people if they know how to do something, like, do you know how to use Google? And in, in this one case, just about everybody will say, yes, I, I know how to use Google. And it turns out that at least in the United States, uh, the overwhelming majority of teachers do not know how to use Google, but they don't know they don't know. And this is a really powerful idea in presenting is to ask people, do you know how to do something? And they say, yes, and then you show them how to actually use what they thought they knew. And, and it's revealed to many that they really have a lot to learn. Uh, so in a moment, I'm gonna to go to Google, I'll do the search. I'll show you what I would have done. Um, by the way, do, do, we have, do we happen to have any questions on this? Yes, uh, we, we, we happen to have a hypothesis. Yeah, what's the hypothesis? Yeah. Yes, that you will Google the researcher's name, Vacanti, and ear mouse, and then the Wikipedia article, Vacanti mouse, also links to the primary source. Yes, let's say that um, it didn't link to the primary source. Let's say the, the Vacanti article in Wikipedia did not, and you just need to know this on any case. So I will... Uh, I'm going to go to Google and do it. And, and by the way, it is a little different than, uh, in fact, to start off, I'm going to, I'm going to use the Wikipedia article as a way of starting my Google search. It turns out the Harvard Medical School teaches all medical students to use Wikipedia to do a search. So in blue, Wikipedia really helps you out. They give you a lot of key links um, and information is, at least in science, is often in blue. So Charles Vacanti, uh, according to Wikipedia, and by the way, and the BBC, so that, that person is right. Vacanti has to be in the search, absolutely. And then it looks like Mass General, Harvard Medical School, uh, MIT, and the Massachusetts Medical School, University of Massachusetts Medical School, might have been different places where uh, the lab might have been. So here we go. I'm going to jump from my review of Wikipedia. I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to type Vacanti, just as your colleague said. And by the way, when you do a Google search, no adjectives, 
no verbs, no adverbs. Let, let me repeat that. No adverbs, no verbs, no adjectives. Just facts, the canty ear mouse. Then I'm gonna use a Google operator, which is built into the algorithm, the word site, colon. And I'm gonna to go to only MIT servers, where you take the domain name of MIT and you limit your results to MIT. This is the only way to limit results to MIT. You can't just type MIT. That will get you articles about MIT. This forces Google to give you MIT. So if I, if I run this article, this search, the canty ear mouse site colon mit.edu. I don't even have to open up. I can see that various uh, sources at MIT talk about implantable tissue or scaffold, and that means implanting also, uh, scaffold. So the search uh, I think is quite important. If I take out MIT, and I leave it to edu, only the extension, that will get me all higher ed in the United States, right? So if I run this search, now I get MIT, I get Harvard, Harvard. So now I get the range of sources, not just MIT, but this gives me only higher education, that part, with these three facts. And now you can see, again, um, implanted tissue. Uh, you can take a look at his lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. It's, it's really quite something when you know how to search. So it, it turns out that a lot of teachers um, would not know in the United States how to design good searches. And to me, that's a serious problem because this is what kids do every day. They, they use Google and they don't know what they're doing typically. In fact, uh, let, let me give you another, another challenge. Um, this is a US example, but uh, you know, we live in a global world and you know better than I do. <laughs> So getting perspective from other countries is unbelievably important if you have to solve problems that are global in nature or just understanding how different people around the world are thinking about a topic, especially if you have to engage with those people. So um, let's say I asked you to do a search on the Iranian hostage crisis, which is the takeover of the American embassy, right? I think it was 1979. Um, find only Iranian sources. I'll give, you, I'll give you a minute. Find only Iranian sources on the um, Iranian hostage crisis and really good sources from Iran, not just any sources, but really good sources. So see what you can do. Uh, this, is, this is an example we would give in a class where, where we ask kids to write a paper about an historic event or an artist or science or, or, or economics. We have all these topics that require global thinking, but it's unbelievably sad that a lot of our students don't understand how to do those searches. So I'll give you a minute. From Iran, get the best content you can on the Iranian hostage crisis. Go. Please go. <clears throat> and while you're doing that, I'll, I'll show you some uh, references. One of the references you're going to need is uh, country code, right? You're going to have to have a listing of all the country codes on the web. So if you type in uh, country code internet, 
um, you'll get a list of all the two letter country codes in the world, which every teacher needs. So showing references, I think is really important when you're presenting sort of background content that helps people solve a problem. So in this case, you, you need the two letters from, from Iran, which is uh, IR, I've, I've looked it up before. So I don't really need to go, but I'm gonna just show it's IR. All right, so you're showing country codes, which are references that you use all the time. Uh, then we go uh, back to Google. And uh, I said earlier that the site command is an operator. So just to show you, operator Google um, uh, search, you know, you need to know the operators. There's a bunch of operators. Uh, here's 42 operators. So here's another reference that people need in order to do what I did. Um, here's all the, the operators search term um, and or this this cache file type I'll use that in this site command you'll you'll see the operators so this is something you'll want to bookmark because you're always going to be using these operators whatever problem you're solving I use this all the time so now we go back to Google and put this together so site colon IR that's how you do a search that only gives you Iranian sources. Here, I'll show you. It, I'm in Iran. And uh, you, you can tell I'm in Iran. Um, if I were to type, give me Iranian, or we'll, we'll be even more specific, only give me, only give me Iranian sources, sorry only give me Iranian sources. And I go and run that search. And if you're in the United States, you won't get any Iranian sources. So I just think it's important as you can imagine to do different kinds of examples when you're presenting. So people can compare and understand and you really wanna show mistakes. You, you have to show mistakes that people will often make Please don't only show how to do something, show common mistakes. For example, another common mistake is you'll, you'll, if I give you that challenge, people will type in Iranian hostage crisis. And, and you'll see, well, you get Wikipedia, which, and, uh, which can be fine. In fact, you could use that as I did before. Um, but all of these, none of these are in Iran. None of these, uh, these are all Western sources, the New York Times. So this kind of search, if you wanted Iranian sources would fail, you would just fail. Uh, so showing failure, really, really important. Okay, so here's my search, site colon ac.ir. Uh, and then I'm gonna type in, uh, Uh, spy den. I'm going to type in uh, conquest, conquest of the, whoops, sorry, American spy den. Go. So, what we've got here is I chose an extension, ac.ir. This only gives me university content in Iran. So I'm, I'm putting things together. What I've learned is when, when you show a, a trick like this Google operator, you have to show different examples of it over and over again. So uh, AC is academic, it replaces EDU. So you, you, you probably know, because so many of you are well-traveled that some countries have EDU like the US and Singapore and Australia and many other countries don't have EDU, they have AC, stands for academic. And um, the country code always follows. So AC.IR is universities in Iran. And then I didn't put in the American description. I, I put in a description 
of what Iranians call this thing, Conquest the American Spy Den. So now I have a result list that um, has no overlap with the assignment Iranian hostage crisis. So my sense is if you're presenting to teachers, example after example is important um, and showing different aspects of, of how to use the same skill. Because of what I've learned is when you teach somebody a skill and they think they've got it, and then you give them another problem, they don't have it. So example after example, if you have the time. In fact, I'm happy if somebody wants to give me a challenge. If somebody has a search that you'd like me to do in a con any content area, I'm happy to do it. You can give me a challenge. I like challenges. What do you think? Is anybody willing to? No, no, no challenges. <laughs> I have a question, not necessarily a challenge, but let's see. Yeah, sure. How to how to translate sources in other languages? Right. So uh, you could go to Google Translate, or let, let's see if I understand what you're what you're asking. Yeah. If I go to uh, Google Translate, detect language, I'll uh, put something from uh, Portuguese into English like this. And then you say, uh, hello. Oh, it's hello. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry. I, got, I don't know Portuguese. Let me, let me change, let me change <laughs> the direction. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I've, I've, I English, think we answered. English, hola. There we go. <laughs> yes. so, uh, Hopefully yeah. we've answered that. And I have a challenge now. Okay, great. S statistics on smoking in Eastern Bloc countries in the 50s and the 80s, to the 80s. Wow. <laughs> yes, that's a very specific challenge, yes. <laughs> okay, Eastern Bloc. Uh, Eastern Bloc countries, yes. So I would need the list of the country codes. Um, What's Romania? RO? I don't, I don't know. What, yes, 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 yes. Is Romania RO? Okay, so we yes. can start colon, RO. Let me just make sure I'm in Romania. Look, is this Romanian? I. This sounds pretty Romanian, yes. Looks like Romania to me. <laughs> um, yes. Then I would need to translate. Uh, smoke. I go back to Google Translate, right? And uh, do some... You could just tell me, well, I better do it. I better do it. Um, hang on for a second. So we'll go to Google Translate and we'll go from Romanian. I hope it's here. Good, yay. English, enter text, uh, smoking, uh, statistics. Going wrong. All the way around. Smoking. Statistic. Is that it? No, actually. Uh, I think. I did, did it wrong. Try, yeah, yeah. Try to put an S at the statistics of. Uh, yeah. To see if it if it changes the. Yes. Now we're right. Am I right? Okay. Yeah. Well, there's there's a danger of yeah. using Google Translate, yeah. so I'm going to copy that, and then I'm going to have a problem because I'm not going to be able to read the Romanian. But a site colon R O, and then I'm going to put this in quotes because it's a phrase. I don't want this is really important. The quotes. A lot of kids don't know that the quotes are really important. It holds those words together when Google does a search. So I'm, I'm sure everybody knows that. I just had to point that, I just had to point that out. Okay, so then we'd run a search. Um, how, may, how are we doing? Can you tell if this is? 
Yeah, I think it has to do with the fact that the uh, the, the text that it's between co quotes, uh, especially the the second word fumatul, is um, has an article as has a definite article at the end, so it will show you yeah. only things where the it appears the expression with the definite article. But yes, we are on topic. I mean, it's a it's okay. an article about smoking. And it's an article where they call, quote, different statistics about smoking. All right. So I did the Google Translate thing, and it went from Romanian to English, and it looks like it's not so good. 21% of the population smokes daily over 15 in 2000. 20 years ago, men smoked three times. So, and then what you would do if smoking has been banned in the Ministry of Health, um, can you tell me what what is this um, what does this word mean? Adeveral. Ad it's the name of uh, Adeveral. It's the name of a of a national outlet here, a national newspaper here. It's a newspaper. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It it okay. means the truth. It means the truth. Yeah. Um, well, this was published in. It looks like it was published in two thousand two, so because it's a newspaper one of the things i would recommend is if it's a more recent article is to write to the reporter get the name of the reporter if you can and find their reporter's email and engage teach people how to engage with the, the person who wrote the article because they probably left out a lot of material that's not in the article. And in the United States, if you write to a reporter, uh, they often will write back and because they love that you're reading their stuff. Um, so it's just another example of taking off on a question and doing more than you had planned. Um, anyway, the good challenge. Uh, I, I would need to spend a little bit more time. Um, what you really want is a government agency or because um, that wasn't a government agency. What about this one? Is this one a government agency, Graduo? No, actually that, I think it's a student paper on oh, okay. one of the websites for student papers. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, but it, does, it does quote uh, statistics about smoking uh, inside it, yeah. You looked at it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if let's see what happens when let's see if I can translate it. Oh no, that's not going to happen. No. What language is it in? Is it in Romanian? probably Romanian? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it may be useful. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, this there's nothing wrong with student papers if they have references. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, that's how I would do it. Um, but I would do it. You know, the question was the Eastern Bloc, so you'd have to run through and do it for all the different countries in the Eastern Bloc. You wouldn't want to make a jump from Romania uh, to Bulgaria and so forth. Um, okay, let me, um, I want to go back and show another example of uh, student work when you're presenting. Um, one, of, one, of, one of the things that's really a tremendous amount of fun is when kids present in a medium that that teachers don't know. So I'm going to do a quick search. I want to show you a, uh, a church in uh, San Diego. Uh, it's a mission church. <clears throat> this is how you can get it. And it's in Minecraft. Uh, and it's on YouTube. So I'm just showing you how I get things. Um, this is it. Uh, it's a fourth grader example of work. Um, and this is not something that we typically see a lot of. One of the dangers of showing a new idea to teachers is they don't know how to assess the work. And very often assessment is left out of a workshop. So I think it's critical to run some activities where teachers look at student work 
and then you challenge them, right now I'll do it. Uh, I'd like you to take a look at this. I'm gonna show you a minute of this example and I'd like you to assess it. What feedback would you give this fourth grader on his project using Minecraft to show the architecture of a church? So here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna play this just for a moment, um, and off we go. Welcome to Mission San Diego Deep Alcala. I'm Father Sarah, and I founded this mission in 1769. It's the first of the 21 California missions. Out front, what you see are the bell tower. Is the bell tower, which is also called the Campanario, and the Diagonal buttress walls, which are for earthquake stability. Come on with me and I'll show you around. Inside this church, there was a Reritos, which is the structure right behind the altar. And over above the doorway, there was a balcony. And this is the courtyard. And it was important because it was where the fiestas, the weddings, and other gatherings. Okay, so like I'm going to speed this up. This kid does not stop. It, this just goes on and on and on. So I'm just going to race through it. He shows the farm outside. He shows how every tool is built, uh, different statues that are built into the walls of this thing. This is actually way beyond the assignment. Um, and what I've learned in presenting is that a lot of teachers can become overwhelmed when they've never seen an example and this is outside, of, like a backyard of this kind of student work. Just an anvil and a few furnaces. And this is Mission San Diego D. Alcala. All right. So now would be the time where. I would ask people to think about it with guidance of different kinds of feedback rather than ch say, just give feedback. For example, I could say, what questions would you like to ask this student about decisions they made when they did this design? For example, they start at the front of the church and give the overview at the end. Uh, perhaps they could have given the overview up front, the whole map. Uh, so asking questions about design, I think can, can lead to the teacher really understanding more about how a student created something. Just asking them about questions of design and decisions they made. What did they leave out? Uh, what was difficult for them, where they have the most fun. Uh, the other thing that I think is really, really important when you're presenting uh, new ideas to teachers is to get them involved in the students self-assessing their own work. It's a, it's a really powerful idea that uh, students would take responsibility for talking about the quality. Um, in this case, it would be, uh, you know, how much research did you do in terms of the background and the history? And you can give kids guidance about their work effort. You know, how much went into the design? Uh, how much went into your presentation of this? And give yourself a grade for different aspects of the work. That way, when a teacher gets work, they see what the kids are thinking about what they felt about the quality of their work. So anyway, Minecraft is one of those things. I could give workshops all day long on Minecraft showing examples of student work, just so much fun um, because stu students are so motivated and engaged in working typically harder in this medium than they would in, in any other medium. Um, I happen to know this kid, this was 20 hours of work on an assignment that could have taken 
uh, 30 minutes. Um, just fascinating to me. Okay. Um, I'm noticing that it's after 10, 10 after 10 here. I, I wonder if we should open up for questions, if there are any. Thank you, thank you, Alan, thank you. Before questions, uh, as I'm sure we will have some, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to thank you for this lovely insights that you have given us into how to build a, a very interesting presentation. Um, I was thinking while following you that actually the, 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 I was thinking that the process is the content. So basically I've learned a lot about how to do webinars for teachers just by watching you <laughs> doing this webinar. So thank you so much for this. And there are a couple of insights that I've uh, wrote it down, uh, which I think are extremely valuable in the sense that it helps so much to show student work when working with teachers, that it helps uh, so much to ask questions, even silly questions, <laughs> to engage the audience in whatever you are doing, to launch a lot of challenges, even challenges that seem a bit, uh, you know, some, some even challenge just for the sake of interacting with people and engaging people in the content that you are doing. Um, I love the question, do you know how to do things? <laughs> I wrote it down that I will definitely use it in some of our <laughs> webinars uh, to give a lot of examples and to show mistakes and tricks, which I think I think we don't show mistakes while we're presenting different ways of solving or different ways of approaching an activity to teachers. And I think for, for us, for example, and for our presentations, one of the most valuable is this idea of presenting ideas of assessment, especially when you're challenging teachers to do a different kind of assessment and to do a different kind of uh, approach to the, to the work that they do. So thank you so, so much for, for this. I'm opening now uh, for questions. And until then, um, some things that have you know, one thing that has one question that has come up, some especially during this period, is if you would have any advice on how to how to attract teachers to participate to online professional development activities, especially when there are so many around. Let me let me see if I understand. Mm -hmm. The problem is teachers won't show up for the webinar. Sometimes, yes, or to, or to engage more or to take on more online, let's say, webinars and uh, activities. Um, right. Well, you, one is you, and I'm probably not going to say anything you don't know, but <laughs> you, you have to have the leadership team fully committed, the principal of the school. So who gives the invitation? <laughs> can be really critical. So if the principal of the school says, I'm going to be on and I want the faculty on, I think you have a better chance, depending on that principal, of course, but you, you have a better chance to get more people on. The other thing that uh, I like to do, here, here's a trick I did not show. When I present, if I'm lucky, I will have a webinar with the students first of that school. So for example, you remember the Google searches I showed you. So, and that will be recorded by the way, the student webinar is gonna be recorded. So I asked the kids on the webinar, uh, do you know how to use Google? Every kid says, yes, I know how to use Google, every kid. And then I start giving them problems in their, in their subjects. They can give me their homework. I said, do a Google search. We can see some of their screens, that's recorded. And uh, then I will show the students, like I showed on this one, how to do a Google search. At the end of that webinar, kids are begging that their teachers learn because they didn't know they didn't know and when they found out 
They did not know. They want to know. So if you could send that video to the teachers in advance of the webinar and say, this is your kids. This is what happened. Watch. If you join this webinar, you will be empowered to help your kids because they know they need you and they're expecting you to learn. So you really want to get teachers to get on the webinar, uh, have their kids say, I've got to learn this. Please join the webinar. I don't know anything more powerful than that. Thank you. That's a very good insight. Thank you. We probably have time for one or more two questions. This this is a quick question. If you generally use video for presentations and for webinars, videos of yourself, I mean, if you if you feel that engaging by video is a powerful way to keep people engaged and interacted. Yes, I do. I now you could send the video out in advance. Mm -hmm. You could have people watch the video. Um, you could uh, engage with Flipgrid. Like I said, you could create videos of the participants in advance. Using Flipgrid would be a great way to do that. Uh, um, but video, and I don't show whole videos. I only show 10 seconds of a video. Mm -hmm. I, I never show a whole video, it's boring. So I, I try to use it, I, I hope I didn't bore anybody. Uh, I try to use it just for short, quick points. Especially student video, student projects that are in video. And also, and I think I think it's a great question to to finish because it's a follow up question. What type of follow up and what type of follow up do you do usually after uh, after webinars with teachers? What type right. of follow up you think it's important to have with teachers after one webinar? Right. So if it's just one webinar, are you going to come back for a second webinar? <laughs> All right. Well, I, there's different different responses. One follow up, and I'm going to do it for you too. I'm going to send you all the links, everything we did, mm -hmm. so that you can go and play if you want to. Um, so so that, that would be minimum follow-up. Uh, if you're teaching a specific subject area like math or science, and you can engage, I love the follow-up where they show student work. They present student, they send in an example of student work. To me, that's the most powerful follow up. Because if the teacher learned it and they just show they learned it, that's not the same as showing they can apply it and see examples of student work. So, follow up with student work is the best, I think, the best quality follow up. So, they send in an example of a Minecraft project or a student paper, or example of a student search, or, or, or. Yes, yes. I think it's actually some, something that we usually tend to forget, that the best way to show that the teachers have learned things is to, to help them practice with their students. Uh, and yes, I, I, I have to think. No yeah. Yes, yes, there's no much. And I will definitely finish with this question because I, we have taken so much of your time, but no, I, f I find it absolutely interesting. What can you do to increase the chances that teachers actually use what they learn? Because they might be excited in the webinar or on the presentation, but still not use in practice the new things. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> um, but the research, the, the follow-up for me, I learned in some of my corporate clients who I think do a much better job generally in staff development than we do in schools. So I'm going to give you from high-tech companies what they do, which I think could work in schools, but we tend not to do it. 
So when somebody comes to a webinar or any staff development, uh, I think there should be a schedule of follow-up by the leader, not the webinar presenter, but the leader of the organization, the principal, department head. And it's a regular schedule, say 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on how much is learned. Mm -hmm. And the follow-up by the leader is something that was clearly articulated to be measurable from the beginning. So let's say this was a webinar on Google search. So what we're going to measure is we're going to have a quiz on using different operators. I just used one of them. And your students will be able to demonstrate the use of these operators for homework assignments you give. And that will happen 30 days from today mm -hmm. or 60 days from today. So you give people an amount of time, clearly defined, and you give them a very, very clear, measurable result. Students will be able to. But it's the leader of the organization who has to take responsibility for making sure that there's a measure of that follow-up, not the webinar leader because the webinar leader has no leverage. There's no accountability, typically. If the webinar leader has accountability, then the webinar leader can do it. But typically webinar leaders don't have accountability. Yes, it makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, so in, in, you know, too much staff development is optional. Come if you want to. No follow-up is built in. Um, it's just like for fun. And we, I think we need to have accountability as the example I, I gave. Well, thank you so much for also for this last insight. Great thank question, you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today and starting your day with us <laughs> and helping us uh, finish it and in such an insightful way. Um, so this has been our second webinar in the series that we have been preparing for uh, people that work in educational NGOs. More will follow soon from our colleagues from the Romanian American Foundation, the US um, Embassy in Bucharest and our friends at the State Department, Department of State. Thank you once again, Alan November for being with us today and wishing you a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Goodbye to everybody.